Well, uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining our OBA RBF Community of Practice webinar series. My name is Inga Panatskeva. I am an infrastructure specialist uh, with the Global Partnership on Output Based Aid. And for the last eight years, I've been working on uh, projects uh, that apply results-based financing across sectors. And as of lately, I am uh, leading the work on impact bonds here at GPOBA. Uh, by way of background, uh, GPOBA launched a webinar series to introduce innovative financing mechanisms that contribute to development solutions. We focus on results-based financing in particular uh, because it has emerged as an important tool for financing basic services um, and it changes the focus from inputs where you fund um, activities or um, in advance um, and the focus is shifted to results, uh, to verified output. As a center of expertise on results-based financing, this webinar is um, a way in which uh, GPOBA brings together practitioners and development partners to share results, experiences, and lessons uh, from the application of results-based finance. Today we will speak about uh, impact bonds, and we will present two of them to you today. Uh, one is on um, using impact bonds for HIV in sex workers in South Africa, and the other one is um, the uh, use of impact bonds uh, to curb unemployment in Buenos Aires, um, Argentina, among youth. And we've invited Social Finance to share with us their experience in designing and implementing them. And joining me from London are three uh, people. One is Rob Mills. And Rob is the Director of uh, International Development Practice at Social Finance. He advises aid agencies, social investors, and private enterprises on how development finance can more effectively tackle economic development challenges. Uh, interestingly, Rob also worked for the World Bank uh, for about eight years, where he originated and managed a large portfolio of energy instruments in southern Africa, as well as advised governments on policy and regulatory reform. And immediately prior to joining social finance, um, Rob held a senior role at Ofgem, the UK's uh, energy regulator. We'll uh, then also uh, hear Eleonora uh, Nadelschiff. Leonor is a manager in Social Finance International Development team. Uh, she has worked uh, on the design of impact bonds and other outcome-based models across a range of development issues, including health, education, and youth employment. She is also advising the design of the development impact bond uh, component of a World Bank-funded Finance for Jobs project in West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and that one is focused around skills matching and employment for youth, um, uh, for youth uh, in the area. Uh, we hope to introduce you to this impact bond at a future webinar. And the third person joining us will be uh, Sebastian Weliseiko. And Sebastian joined social finance in 2016 uh, to lead the development of an impact bond supporting an intervention to tackle unemployment among uh, vulnerable youth in the city of Buenos Aires. Sebastian is also the uh, Program Manager of the Global Steering Group for Social Impact Investment, a continuation of the Impact Investment uh, Task Force established by the G8. Before I give the microphone to Rob to uh, introduce us to impact bonds, um, I would like to uh, remind everyone that on your screens on the um, uh, left hand side, uh, you will have a chat in which you can post your questions during the uh, presentation. And uh, I'll, be, I'll make sure that we address them in the Q&A uh, uh, session right after the presentation. Well, Rob, tell us about Impact Bonds. Thanks, Inga. So just firstly checking the uh, connectivity. We're, we're connecting from London. There are three of us in the same room. Hopefully everyone can see us, and we'll do some kind of switching around between the three of us. Um, so what we want to do is, for me to do it, just a short introduction to impact bonds and, and what we in social finance think that their value is. And then to give you a couple of good case studies of things we're working on right now. Um, we'll take about 20 minutes or so. Apologies for the late start. We don't quite have the uh, 
technological capability at this end that you have um, back in DC. So um, anyway, let's keep going. Um, where should I start? So from social finance, and we're not going to talk much about what we do, um, but just to, just to state from the beginning, as an organization, we're particularly focused on what results-based financing can do. And in our international work, um, we're particularly focused on how to improve the efficiency and efficacy of aid. We also do work on the UK side, which does something similar with UK government spending. Um, and our work within results-based financing more broadly, we're particularly focused on, on outcomes, so how uh, those with money, commissioners, donors, agencies, can move to work in an outcomes commissioning, an outcomes focused way. Uh, so that's essentially what the kind of background, really background is. Uh, just briefly on myself, uh, I mean, I was a classic operational TTL at the bank uh, for quite a few years. My main chunk of work was in the uh, energy practice in the Africa region. And you know, like most bank TTLs, I you know, put, put through, I put together, brought to the board, and then implemented large programs uh, in you know, the Africa region, mainly IDA programs. Um, people listening probably have a a range of experiences, both on IDA and IDRD program. But you probably all, if your bank operational colleagues, have spent some time kind of suffering through the system of how what I would call input-based aid works. We spend a lot of time in your project preparation thinking about in your results framework how everything fits together and how you're going to essentially plan out this project for the next four, five, six years. And In my time at the World Bank as a TTL, a lot of the work is quite input focused. And we didn't spend enough time genuinely trying to work out what the outcomes we were looking for were, and then essentially leaving more room to whoever the service provider, whoever the, um, the implementing agency was to actually get that. Um, on classic World Bank projects, in classic World Bank investment project, you tend to manage quite carefully all the different inputs. So the case for a more of an outcomes-based approach is that by strengthening the link between the actual funding, the money in, so let's say for a bank project, it's either, and the actual impact you're trying to get, you're going to have more accountability, and you're going to essentially get to better development outcomes. So what we do when we talk about an impact bond as an example of an outcomes-based approach, we try to focus solely on the results. So the funding that will be provided by a um, a donor, it could be a bilateral, it could be a multilateral at the World Bank, is directly tied to the success of that intervention. So if the outcomes that are agreed at the outset, the negotiated at the outset, are achieved, great. If they're not, well, there's no payments made. That's a slightly different approach from a kind of classic World Bank or classic bilateral aid project. And you know, the way we see it is that you're going to maximize the, the efficacy. So not just the efficiency of ADs, but actual, the actual kind of efficacy of it. And a couple of important elements of that. If you're genuinely focusing on outcomes, you're going to have to understand um, what's happening. So there's going to be rigorous measurements uh, as you go along to, to be able to prove that your outcomes are indeed being met. So you need evidence of what works, but also the ability to adapt as you go. So to learn from what you're measuring, to learn from the evidence you're collecting during the course of the project and then adapt so that, as people everyone knows, if you do a five or six year project, and my experience at the bank of the CTL was, you'd end up restructuring half those projects because things have changed on the ground. And if you focus on outcomes, then there's an ability to adapt to on the ground circumstances but still have the same outcomes that you're seeking. Then a separate but related element is around co-investment. So if you can actually demonstrate a clear link between the funding going in and the results coming out and clear value for money, then that's more likely to leverage other funds in. And then thirdly, I was thinking about innovation in that if you have providers who are not in either input-based aid where you're just trying to deliver exactly what it says in the results framework or the log frame, and not in classic output-based aid either where you're having to, um, to sort of pre-finance your intervention you're having to then think very carefully about the risk, and you might actually be less innovative and take less risk. In impact bond, if someone else, a social investor up front is funding you to be innovative and to achieve the outcomes everyone wants, 
then you have an incentive to innovate so that you know, the, the local needs you address on the ground are actually met. So that's some of the kind of broad case from outcomes-based approach in development science more broadly. That sort of works, putting it in a really kind of simple way, in a simple graphic. You know, the original plan is a straight line, right? So the results framework is saying, well, we're going to do the following activities. If 100 percent activities, we'll spend 100 percent of the money, and we're going to deliver 100 percent of the results, and it's all going to be on time. So that's what a kind of uh, a results framework says. And as we all know, that's a complete lie. The moment a project, you know, like a World Bank project, um, clears the World Bank board and you start implementation, your actual experience looks something like more on the, on the bottom. These processes, as we all know, in reality aren't linear. Um, they go backwards and forwards. You, you, you take wrong turns, uh, contracts go wrong, uh, and you learn from experience. So actually, if you focus on outcomes, then you're going to have a a sort of more honest and accountable process over time. All right, so just briefly to think about impact on versus other ways of delivering an aid program. Um, and this is all just kind of overview. We're going to get on in a minute to um, some specific case studies. But to, to the way I think about these things, um, on the, the left-hand side, there's a set of things related to how you deliver aid program. So uh, running down the left-hand column, you know, who's receiving the aid, uh, and what's the timing of it, uh, and what basis do you actually disperse money, what is the source of the money up front, uh, who takes the risk, and finally, when you manage the performance in the implementation, say, you know, who is doing that? And if, if we then go across the, the, uh, the three columns, the traditional aid is what I call kind of input-based aid, whether it's a grant from a bilateral or a concessional loan from a multilateral. Well, this is kind of a classic aid project. You, you have money being lent to government or service provider or, or, or grant basis. Um, the money gets paid often up front for predefined inputs, and the risk sits really with, with the donor. It, in the lot based financing world, so the, the two columns to the right, um, there's what I would call conventional PBR, an output-based aid. You tend to see to get onto the basis for payment. You're still really defining pre-agreed outputs. And you're saying that the source of the financing up front is going to be the service provider, which already introduces a lot of risk for them. And the, so the risk is for the service provider. And the donor still stays heavily involved. You know, there's still a lot of phone being used, um, a lot of close tracking and monitoring of the role. But if you move to the, 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 the right-hand column, the impact bonds, so the difference here is that if you see the kind of the red boxes, the, the outcomes are pre-agreed, but not necessarily the inputs. So it's an outcome-based program. So it'll be some sort of social investor who finances things up front. So there's risk capital. It's not the donor's risk capital. It's somebody else's risk capital that takes on the risk. So that you know, the, the, invest, the risk sit with the investor. And the way it's managed through the life of the project or program, whatever it is, is done in such a way that there's an incentive for the investor to allow the service provider to, to innovate, to learn, and to adapt. So it's a big focus on adaptive delivery. So I think you can see already that the that, that in terms of some key characteristics of how you do aid look quite different when you come to an impact bond. Okay, so that's a little bit abstract. We'll come back in a minute to, to make this a bit more real with some case studies. But just to kind of say up front that we're not talking about any kind of silver bullet here. And certainly an impact bond will work well in some situations, but not in others. So given what I've just said, an impact bond would work well where you have a, a complex problem, but you have a clear sense of what the outcome is. Um, but you don't necessarily know what the, you know, the, the right set of inputs are um, to meet that. So um, you probably need something innovative, uh, innovative intervention. You want to have some evidence base, probably somewhere else for that, but you want to have a sense of this being something that hasn't been tried in this particular context before. So the, the optimal sequencing of those inputs is, well, you don't really know necessarily up front what works. It's either unknown or sometimes actually unknowable. And you need some sort of external risk capital to defray the risk from the, the, uh, the service provider at the heart of the intervention. Fine, and that works well in those situations. Um, it doesn't mean that it's kind of a simple project, like, say, an example I would use, things from energy sector, something like a 
a rural electrification project where you're connecting a new uh, village or town to the medium voltage or low voltage grid. Well, you kind of know what the inputs are, you know what the outputs are. Uh, it's not a particularly complex problem. There's no particular innovation. You know what the right sequencing of inputs is. It's just an, an engineering exercise. And you don't necessarily need some external risk capital to take on the risk. So there are plenty of cases where conventional input-based aid is fine. We're not talking about those cases. We're talking about more complex social problems, um, and we'll get on to those examples in South Africa and Argentina in a minute. Fine, but also there's the conditions to be met. So you have to be able to measure the outcome. And obviously, you can't um, reward an investor for uh, outcomes if you can't measure them. Measurable means reliable data. You have to be able to say from evidence that the inputs are actually leading to the outcomes. So the outcomes are attributable. There's an attribution. Um, it's possible to attribute the outcomes as opposed to something else being um, uh, accounting for the outcomes we've got. There has to be an ability to deliver on the ground and to, to be able to iterate, to learn and iterate your, um, your intervention. And the availability of social investors who are prepared to take the risk and finance something up front, that has to be there. But it's also important that the particular intervention is a priority, obviously, for the government, but also for donors as well. So the outcome funder has to ultimately pay up if the intervention is successful. Okay, so we can we can talk a bit more at another point around those conditions, but those are some of the basic ones from our point of view. Okay, um, just a, I'll just give you one more slide in terms of um, kind of the mechanics of a an impact bond. Um, I am assuming from the chat messages coming down that people can hear me adequately, and that the slides are, are working now. So how does it did work? So. At the heart of any intervention, whether it's input-based aid or uh, impact bonds as a, as a form of outcomes-based aid, you'll have, as you say, at the bottom of the screen in the brown boxes, a, a, a kind of service provider. Now, there may be some sort of sub-service providers attached to that, but they'll be the ones on the front line delivering some kind of intervention. It could be a social enterprise, it could be a charity, um, service provider of different sorts. It could even be you know, a government entity. That service provider is responding to a service contract held with a, an impact bond manager, which essentially sits in the middle of the transaction and keeps everybody honest. At the very top, you have an investor who's coming in up front with capital to, to pay for the, the intervention. Um, and that's, that's intermediated by the manager, the impact bond manager. And obviously, their return, the investor's return, depends on the success of the intervention. And then you would have, on the right-hand side, the blue box, the outcome planner, which would be um, payments for success which are independently verified. So it's very simple. Anyone who's done any project finance um, would recognize this as a particularly simple, uh, simple structure. Okay, so the audio, I, I think we'll probably just I've seen some of the messages. I think we'll just carry on as best we can um, uh, rather than trying to get the microphone at this point. So that realize we're running quite a lot of time. All right, so. There is a final slide here. I think this slide pack will be distributed afterwards. But there's a summary slide saying here that in the right situation, for the right kind of problems where you have the right preconditions in place, particularly around the evidence base and the ability to collect data and the course correct as you go, there are good grounds for using a new type of outcomes-based um, commissioning instrument as opposed to the kind of classic input space data. That will be enough overview for now, particularly given time. Um, what I'm going to try and do is move directly to uh, two case studies, one on um, HIV and sex workers in South Africa, and then a separate one on youth employment and skills in, in Buenos Aires. Um, we're just going to do this in a highly manual way by moving, so bear with us, and I hope that the quality is good enough in terms of sound. Okay, so first to my colleague, Ellie. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much, Rob. In the interest of time, we'll uh, we'll keep this brief again. But um, thank you. we have been working with the South African government and the Global Fund, uh, as well as other local partners, to explore a SIB to support HIV and prevention among uh, sex workers in South Africa. Now, I'll keep this very brief. 
But essentially, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the problem is that female sex workers in South Africa are disproportionately affected by HIV. Um, levels are uh, upwards of 60% in some areas of Johannesburg, and, uh, and the challenge is really that people aren't accessing uh, antiretroviral therapies, so accessing clinical services to support their, their treatment. Up to 7% of new infections have been linked to sex workers, um, but uh, as we're saying, the, the proportion uh, accessing care are, are very low. So the recent study by the University of California showed that uh, of those who knew that they were HIV positive, which was 74%, the proportion who sought care was relatively high at 67%. But those who were accessing treatment were very low, at lower than 20% on antiretroviral therapy. So we can only imagine that the level of viral suppression among the population is less than 5%. So the problem is relatively simple, but as ever the solution is, is very complex. Current programs have been very successful in raising awareness of HIV and the need for HIV testing and knowledge. But, as you say, the health outcomes have been very poor and there's a real breakdown in the continuum of care. Once sex workers have uh, realised that they're HIV positive, they go along to a, a clinic to, to get an HIV um, uh, health screening and, and often this is, this is where the, the problems lie. They are referred into government clinics and they experience uh, stigma and marginalisation. And so they don't want to come back, which is very unsurprising. So the, the challenge is really for the, the South African government, how do they support this kind of population? Sex work is criminalised in South Africa and they, they struggle to actively engage this group. There's no trust in terms of uh, reliance on healthcare and support. So retention in care is a real challenge. Key populations like sex workers are included within government programs like high transmission area programs, but this doesn't necessarily match onto sex, match onto sex worker areas. So programs have to date focused on peer education and relying on referrals to clinics. And the, the challenge is really how can we try and keep more sex workers in, uh, in clinical support and retain and how can we provide those services in a way which means that they're more likely to come back rather than less likely to come back. Many challenges, including uh, accessing services around opening hours and that kind of thing. So we're, we're looking at whether or not a mobile clinic type model could offer a more appropriate and suitable service for sex workers to engage with on a reliable basis. Now, contrary to what Rob was saying earlier, uh, data in this area is incredibly poor, as you can imagine. So one of the key areas for the social impact bond to, to focus on is really how can we improve data access and how can we improve knowledge about what works where and why. There's been positive movement in the country around a program, a national program to support sex workers. So last year, a national plan including uh, health support but also human rights support was launched and there is a consensus among the civil society, government and other key actors that uh, a comprehensive approach is needed in order to mo more effectively support the sex worker population. Now, there are many, many challenges, as we talked about, including uh, stigma and marginalisation, uh, delivery of appropriate services, and, and how to really engage sex workers in a service that works for them. So funding is one problem, but limited information around what works where and why is, is an even bigger one. The difficulty is compounded because there are different types of sex worker models in, in South Africa. So in Soweto, it's a tavern-based system, whilst in, uh, in Pretoria, there's more street-based work. So this is where the need for flexibility arises and where an impact bond could add value in terms of being able to 
flexibly adapt to the different types of supports that are offered and the ways in which they're offered. So the idea here is really to test different types of models. Would opening at certain hours in certain areas work more effectively than in others? At the moment, there's no system for collating that data and information, so this is a big value add in terms of improving knowledge uh, and, and understanding around how to support these populations. By focusing on health outcomes like antiretroviral retention and viral suppression, the, the SID model offers flexibility to, to tailor the, the delivery of services. So. It's not that there's a pre-agreed plan laid out in terms of uh, on month one, X will happen, on month two, Y will happen. Uh, there's more flexibility to move between different models. Can we carry on? Hi. We're going to try a different audio method to try and improve the sound. Okay. Right, we're going to try and connect the audio this way. I'm going to ask Inga if that is in any way audible. I think that sounds a little better, although um, can you make it louder shout. on your end? Um, we'll just have to shout as best we can. Okay, so if that's okay, we will carry on using the, the webinar platform and we'll cut the phone line. Okay? Fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, move on. And we can, if you have any questions, then do raise them at the end because we're trying to leave more, more time for that, I think. Um, so, so ultimately, the, the SID model will focus on strengthening the continuum of care, so moving beyond uh, looking at coverage, so numbers of sex workers that are reached and trying to look at retention in care and ultimate health outcomes like viral suppression. There's a number of design elements uh, I've mentioned which are in process and which are going to be a challenge to tackle. Um, so the first one is around data and data tracking for a population that is criminalized. That's a real challenge. So there are new innovations like using unique identifier codes that are being explored and tested. So this will be a part of the, the SIB uh, and the learning process in order to try and build a model for dealing with a complex and, um, and moving population. The next piece is, is around uh, measurement and creating the right incentives. Human rights is a very important component here, so ensuring that there is a right to choose um, as to the most appropriate treatment method uh, and way of engaging with services is going to be really important. But from the government perspective, there, there's a number of positive um, areas that the outcome approach of a social impact bond can bring. So. One is in terms of offering an opportunity to integrate innovative and flexible delivery approaches into their program. Um, this can be through partnerships with service providers, um, government, private actors and, and intermediaries to try and make a solution that works for the beneficiaries. It's a way for government to allocate funding to a population that they find difficult to support if they can offer a payment based on a results basis, then that is a win-win for everybody. It also makes it easier to engage with a population that has historically been left at the sidelines of, uh, of health services. And it's a way of building data and uh, database learning into the approach. So adaptive management is, a, is an important part of this program. Um, it's, it's a way to, to essentially commission a new type of service for the government, and, and that's why and it's, an, and it's an exciting innovation. We'll just pass over to Seb now, he's going to talk to us about Buenos Aires. Cool, so switching places here. Uh, hello, everyone. I will try to speak. Um, loud and try to speak slow. So just uh, let me know if things are not working, um, we'll, we'll change something. So I will keep it extra brief because I see that we don't have uh, much time if we want to fit a few questions. 
So um, let me move on uh, to talk about the uh, social impact bond in, in Buenos Aires. Um, well, there is a question coming from, from Bianca. We'll try, try to, uh, you know, we were talking about a social impact bond in the context of Buenos Aires, because coming back to the structure that Rob showed in the beginning, here uh, the commissioner, the outcome payer, is the government. So typically we call that a social impact bond, uh, as opposed to a developing impact bond where typically the outcome funder is a philanthropic uh, donor agency. So uh, I will just say that there is more to be said on that front. Um, so in, in, in Buenos Aires, uh, it really, the SIP market, uh, or the, yeah, the impact bond market in Latin America really picked up um, following an initiative from the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the um, Multilateral Investment Fund, um, MIF, launched a dedicated facility to support the development uh, of SIP deals um, in, in different countries. So now there are five active projects uh, in, in four different countries. So under the facility, the government of Argentina looks for assistance to uh, develop the deal, and also the bank uh, is going to be, also the um, MIF is going to be an investor in the deal. We'll see that uh, a bit later. Um, Argentina's government uh, is increasingly interested in leveraging private capital to tackle social issues, recognizing that uh, you know private and public partnerships are essential to tackle the growing and complex social, uh, social issues of our time. Um, this administration is you know very forward-looking and, and really welcoming private participation in this kind of in, in the kind of deals. Uh, so they thought that uh, the first area to cover this would be, you know, a, a great opportunity to do it in an in, 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 in an employment um, program. So the focus is on uh, young people, young vulnerable people that struggle to get into employment. Uh, having a young person not in employment, educational training in the long term has uh, a real a high cost to to society. Um, so working on prevention of that uh, yields uh, a, a sizable uh, social value to um, the government. And the government in this case is seeing this particular SIF in Buenos Aires as a pilot that could potentially be rolled out nationally or tackling um, other social issues um, countrywide. So moving on to the, the, the rational, so I will cover perhaps a different uh, angle. Um, as I said, the, the government of the city uh, wants to promote greater collaboration uh, with the private sector, with the social organizations, and as Rob was saying, this administration is really embracing uh, a cultural shift towards commissioning outcomes rather than keep financing as traditionally uh, we've seen in, in Latin America and other areas, um, you know, a, a commissioning inputs, paying for, for inputs. And also there in the employment and training space, you typically see multiple uh, different programs that overlap uh, and the impact evidence of those efforts is really, really um, low. Um, so the government thought that this would be one particular area where already a lot of funding is going into with no particular focus on, on outcomes. And also um, there is a, a, a vast community of service providers working on the employment space uh, we are talking to around 20 right now. Uh, they are uh, active in different stages of the of the training, um, and this will it also um, uh, promote a strong cultural shift within the social sector organizations. So the strategic um, uh, intention of the government is also to build capacity uh, within service providers and lead that uh, legacy. Uh, well, that slide is coming in a bit funny uh, in in our computer at least. Uh, the slide with the structure, ah, sorry, if you can just click everything. Um, as I said, the government of, of Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires Ciudad, is the, the commissioner. Um, there is a, a group providing upfront investment. The anchor investor is the uh, multilateral investment fund from the Inter-American Development Bank, plus uh, local social investors that we are uh, approaching as we speak and later on in the, in the deal. Um, well, local service providers working with beneficiaries, these young people from the south of the city where employment uh, outcomes and employment situation is typically much uh, poorer than in the rest of the city. 
uh, social finance is acting as the intermediary structure in the deal, and very importantly, we partner with a local organization that also uh, the intention of the bank is to create local capabilities uh, and leave that legacy in the local market. Um, so uh, quite straightforward and building on what Ross said, so just in the, in the interest of time, we can perhaps move to the last one. Uh, so to date, um, we have validated a number of things on the target population, uh, trying to refine who are we working with, uh, and we did started doing a survey, a very comprehensive survey of service providers, understanding where they are most active, where there is uh, emerging evidence of the effectiveness of the programs uh, they run, where they are struggling, uh, and trying to see um, in terms of the needs of, the, of our target population, these young people living in the southern um, uh, areas, of the city, what a suitable intervention would look like uh, for, for reaching the uh, employment outcome, is getting these young people into decent employment. Um, and we are working as we speak on the design uh, with you know fantastic partners on the government side and also uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and as we speak, we are also building the business case, so it's the very basic premise that the social value created by the intervention is uh, higher than the cost of the intervention and the cost of structuring and managing the deal. I think there was a question around that. I saw that coming before. Uh, so uh, during the feasibility analysis, we're trying to prove that um, premise. Uh, and as we speak as well, uh, very important in this experience for both the government and the bank is to build local capabilities um, within government, with local investors, uh, and also with the local intermediaries, effectively our partners uh, at social finance. So I think, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we'll park it there, and if there are any questions around this particular project, we'll, we'll tackle them separately. So back to Rob. Thank you, uh, Sebastian, it back. thank you, Leonor, and uh, Rob. Um, very interesting presentation. I want to apologize to everyone again for the mishaps with the audio, but we're ready now to go into the Q&A. We received a, a lot of questions, great ones. And Rob, I will start with maybe a couple of them that you can address uh, right off the bat. Um, so it looks like people are interested in um, uh, you know, what bonds are and what they are not, because there's still this confusion in terminology, uh, and it's in reality a misnomer. Uh, so if you can briefly address that, and then um, uh, talk about the risk allocation in the scheme. There are several questions here speaking, uh, asking about the roles of different stakeholders, um, the go-in-between, uh, how that plays out, and what happens if the outcomes are not achieved. How does it work out in terms of payments? Okay, so um, before we start, we have more time at our end if we want to run past the, uh, the cut-off on the hour, but that's up to you, Inge, if you want to do that. Um, anyway, so I think probably the, some of the first comments I made, the audio wasn't very clear, and one of the first comments I made was that an impact bond isn't a bond. So for people who have a kind of finance background, this is not a fixed income instrument. Um, there was a question around securitization of, of these bonds. The nature of them is more potentially equity risk. So there's no there's no ownership in the way that equity would imply. But the risk characteristic is more like equity. Um, in that a social investor is financing somebody, some sort of service provider, some sort of social enterprise to do something up front. And the agreement between the social investor on one hand and the outcome funder on the other hand, which is you've seen in, in the, the kind of the structure diagrams we've shown, if the outcome is not achieved, then the social investor takes the hit. So there was a question there about where does the risk sit? The risk sits with the social investor. It's not a fixed income instrument in the regular sense, so it's perhaps best described as a, a kind of a compact rather than a bond. Whoever came up with the word bond probably had some. Um, and some responsibility for, for the nomenclature. Um, but think of it as having equity type risk, um, which there is uh, some potential upside for the social investor if the outcomes are achieved or exceeded. And at the outset, there is a negotiation essentially between the outcome funder, you know, the donor or the government as to you know, when they will pay out and what outcomes, um, between that outcome funder and the social investor. 
Now, in terms of you know, is the outcome binary? Is it kind of a yes, no, you've hit the outcome or you haven't, payment or no payment? It could be, but it's more likely to be a, a slightly more um, gradated or um, subtle um, assessment of what the outcome is. So you might have in the upfront negotiation between the, the outcome funder and the social investor saying, well, if you meet you know, the following target, then the return is X percent um, of your capital plus a return. Uh, if you only, if you miss that by you know, a certain amount, then your return is lower, and if you exceed it, then you know, the return is even higher. So you, you in most cases, will probably have a, um, a, a gradation of, of payments for the outcome being achieved. Um, there was a comment about these are very expensive because it's commercial funding. So just to be clear, when we talk about a social investor, it is, it's private money that is providing the risk capital, that's providing the upfront financing, but we're not talking about Goldman Sachs here. We're not talking about you know, a, um, a private equity fund. We're, when we talk about private money, we're talking about, to date, mostly foundations who might traditionally have been working in a, on a grant basis, but now are interested in being more innovative with how they program their money. No one's looking at you know, very significantly double digit rate of returns. And often the amount of risk that the social investor is taking on is, is quite high. So, but for example, the first social impact bonds in the US, which was for reducing prisoner reoffending rates, well, actually the interventions weren't as successful as the social investor had hoped. Um, the outcomes weren't achieved and there was no payment made. So they had a significant loss. So we're not talking about anything commercial So there's a few comments which perhaps people may at the beginning. And Inga, over to you for another kind of Two or three questions. Depending on how much. Time we've got. Uh, 
Actually, um, uh, maybe in a different We could address. 